Good afternoon. Uh, those of you who've seen me stand here before know that I normally begin these speeches uh, counting off how many prime ministers I've had in the last three and a half years and how many ministers for education I've had in the last three and a half years. I won't do that because we're in an election uh, campaign at the moment. The other thing I also look for, and I asked for uh, when we last convened, which was just before Christmas, I had a note to Santa Claus where I asked for policy certainty. Um, and I have some of that, and so far as I have a policy framework uh, options document. Um, in many ways, it reminds me of the choose-your-own-adventure novels of my youth, where there's many possible outcomes, and it is literally you, as the person who makes the choice, will have to live with the choices you make, and that's what the sector has been presented with. But we have crystallized the debate, and it's far, far better to have a consultation before a decision than the other way around as occurred in 2014. Um, this is to be welcomed, and, and as it's an open consultation, and as it's a consultation that everybody in this room can feed into, um, I'm going to give you some of my thoughts about how I'll feed into it. Um, they're not the ATN view, it's certainly the view of me as the Vice-Chancellor of the University of South Australia. Now, as the Minister noted, uh, much of this debate and many of the options which are presented in the paper go right back to issues that were raised as far back as when Jane Lomax-Smith conducted her base funding review. Uh, there are other previous government policies in the mix, and it shows that we've got questions which have lingered for very many years and really was at the heart of my quest for policy stability over the last three and a half years. Now, we have to find a solution that gives continuity and consistency. We can't operate as a sector uh, or even as individual institutions without funding uh, certainty, um, without verting funding certainty as we, as we look forward uh, on year on year. The importance of higher education is captured in this document, um, and it's pretty well understood, but it perhaps needs some better treatment and better reflection in policy. We talk about the benefit to the individual and to the, uh, the, to the state, to the exchequer, and that's at the basis of the 50-50 split, which is likely to be advanced in terms of the distribution of cost. But we also know that graduates ent entering the economy have a massive impact beyond uh, their own present uh, employment. Graduates entering the workforce create 25,000 new jobs for non-graduates every single year. So the number of graduates in the economy is actually a, a, a direct uh, begetter of new employment. We do uh, welcome the fact, uh, the acknowledgement, of course, that the, the theory of full market forces may not actually apply to higher education, and I'll talk about that in a few moments later on. What I didn't see in the document, um, um, which Warren has touched on, and which the minister touched on but didn't affirm, is any commitment to the preservation of the demand-driven system. Um, that the ambiguity about that needs to be addressed in this, in this run-up to the election, and certainly immediately afterwards in terms of where we stand and how we intend the sector to go forward. There are key principles in the option paper, which I, uh, rec I recommend get used as, as a, a benefits framework against which the policy can be measured. And only if we provide uh, solutions which match up to the ambitions in that framework should they be progressed. The minister talked about postgraduate places today and sub-bachelor pathways. Um, both of those are capped in the current system. And apologies, this is a bit of a policy wonk, uh, a, de a deep dive. It's an area where we need to make significant progress. Um, we have a demand-driven system. We have a world-renowned and emulated system of deferred income contingent loans. And that finances the equitable attainment of education. That has to be preserved. The principles make notes of pathways. Um, there are two key pathways beyond the traditional degree. One is postgraduate, and we operate within an effective cap at postgraduate load. The allocation of the cap is uh, somewhat opaque. It varies from institution to institution. As the Minister noted earlier on, postgraduate pathways allow rapid means to upskill workforce to meet employment demand and the furnishing of better qualified employees. The other end of pathways, as was referenced earlier on, is what's called sub-bachelor. And it's in that space that our, our university has been extremely successful. Um, the Minister referenced the UniSA College. That works to provide access to education for non-traditional entrants. The majority of those people come through our one-year foundation study program in the college. And that gets people ready to be successful learners. That's a sub-bachelor program. The students are not charged for that program. Uh, they spend a year in the institution for free. The costs are something that the university bears out of our commitment to enabling access to education. The capping of sub-bachelors means that the Commonwealth makes a contribution to support 343 sub-bachelor students in the enabling program in our university. That includes our foundation students. We educate 900 a year through that program, and the institution carries the can on the rest. Two-thirds of every single one of those students are low SES uh, derived equity group participants. They're individuals who seek an opportunity to access education and the chance to succeed. 
any policy framework which gets advanced has to include supporting the success of the most vulnerable learners. And in that vein, as Warren did, I will also make an observation around the budgetary cut that was enacted on HEP, which is the Higher Education Participation and Pathways Programme. There's a 20% cut, cut to that programme over the uh, forward estimates. That equates to a saving of $152 million. That's one of the very few areas that are in the higher education budget that can be cut without enacting legislation. So I understand why that has happened, because it's a means of fe fiscal rectitude. UniSA derives $6 million in funding from the HEP program on an annual basis. And we use that to support Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander access, programs of outreach, foundation programs, and enabling and community programs. We do that in partnership with the two institutions that sit here at the table with me. Two thirds of those students in our college programs are from low SES groups. 25% of the students in the University of South Australia are from a low SES background. Low SES cuts affect institutions in different ways. The sector is not homogenous in this regard. Our retention rate is higher than the national average. Enrollments grow in this, de in this department, but they also complete. Completions are up 17% year on year because of the programs we put in place. Cutting HEP does nothing but reduce our ability to support these types of students. And the impact of those cuts will be felt more acutely in our institution than in many others. We've been committed to equity and participation since our inception and walk the walk on participation. It's a cut that takes from the have-nots. I have no difficulty with the options papers call for a review of what's left with HEP. I do question how we define value for money in the assessment of equity. Nothing was said today about regional universities because none of the three institutions that sit at the table are actually considered to be a regional university. Um, but we have a campus in Wyala, we have a campus in Mount Gambia, we educate in community in the APY lands. We just invested $21 million in the regional support of our students. We provide that education as regional education, and if that's not regional, I don't really know what is. The discussion is framed around investment, which could be viewed as preserving the occupants of marginal or challenged regional seats, where there are dedicated regional universities. But I ask, what about universities that are actually dedicated to regional education? The whole of regional education support and engagement needs a wide lens as we move into this next phase of our policy. On hex repayments, I am all for pragmatism. I think we have fiscal pragmatism at play. The objective will ultimately be to see the student pay more. The 50-50 split can be defined as equitable and fair, as long as the supports are in place to allow a meritocracy of access. Thresholds for payment could be raised to be less painful rather than reduced to ensure more people pay quicker. In the paper, the elephant in the paper, if you will, is the issue of flagship courses and fee deregulation. Challenge number one, define a flagship. How many flagships can we have? Who says what the game will be in terms of their naming? Is it going to be quality, uh, perceived quality, actual quality, economic importance, impact, relevance to the economy, relevance to the individual's earning potential, international linkage. There's so many variables that I think we will be having a debate for quite some time. Challenge number two is that this is effectively the deregulation of 20% of the undergraduate places in our universities. Implementation challenges aside, I wonder, is that the beginning of the creation of a two-tiered system? Will it reinforce a new era of elitism in higher education? Those that who can afford to pay will be enabled access to flagships. Will flagships sit inside the demand-driven system with their places uncapped? There are 155 years of evidence from the US that public good is directly tied to the co and correlated with the success of public institutions. Access and meritocracy do not equate to mediocrity. The University of South Australia is evidence of this in our standing in graduate outcomes, graduate employability, the ranking of our research, the impact we have in our society. But elite and exclusion may be dreadfully synonymous. And that cannot be allowed to eventuate in our higher education system. Thank you.